Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Carnex Solutions PLC Investor Presentation for the final results for the year ended 31st of March 2021. Throughout this presentation, investors are being listen only mode. Questions are encouraged and can be submitted at any time via the Q&A tab situated on the right hand corner of your screen. Simply type in your question and press send. The company may not be in a position to answer every question it received during the meeting itself. However, the company review all questions submitted today and publish responses where it's appropriate to do so. These will be available via your Investor Meet Company dashboard and you'll be notified once they're ready for your review. I'd also like to remind you this presentation is being recorded. Before we begin, I'd like to submit the following poll. And I'd now like to hand you over to Tommy Cook, CEO, and Ashley Grennan, CFO of Calix Solutions PLC. Good afternoon. Oh, thank you, and good night, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome along to the first set of full results from Calnex uh, since we listed uh, back in October. So before I go in, and Ashley and I are going to give you a detailed overview of what happened in FY21, but before we do that, I thought for some of you may not be completely familiar with Calnex, we would just take a few minutes to remind everyone who Calnex is and what we do. So Calnex generates test equipment for the telecommunications industry. We design, produce, and manufacture test instrumentation. Our test instrumentation is used to prove critical performance of infrastructure in the new telecoms networks being developed around the world. We started back in 2006, launched a first product in 2007, and since then I've been at the forefront of the global test and, uh, test and measurement industry. We have been successful at selling into all the subgroups within the telecom sector, that's the network operators, the network equipment manufacturers, and the component manufacturers, as well as being increasingly successful with the large enterprises that are running their own networks, and also the hyperscale companies that are building these data data centers. So to date, we've actually managed to secure orders and ship products to over 600 customer sites in 68 countries around the world. The test and measurement fits into just about every part of the life cycle of the telecoms industry, from when you're developing new equipment to when you're manufacturing equipment to when you're building networks or when you're managing and maintaining networks. The bits that we primarily focus on is mainly in the R&D phase when they're building new equipment. So that's into the R&D design validation and standards conformance testing. And the reason we focus on that is that is an area where we feel that we can deliver real value. And very much we are an enabler to our customers. Our customers are obviously trying to get their new product to market as quickly as they can. But it's not a matter just quickly. It needs to be robust. They need to ensure they get good design margins so they don't have problems in manufacturing and that it's going to meet all the various scenarios that it's going to be inflicted on it once it's in the real world. So they want to run with all real world scenarios to check that it meets them and also that it conforms to the various standards. So we enable our customers to get their product to market quickly if we give them the right functionality at the right time. And when you do that, then you can command healthy margins from your products by getting the product to the customers at the right time. The one other area that we focus on is maintenance test. Installation tests and first level maintenance these days in live networks tends to be done by fairly limited amount of testing, putting things together, running quick self tests, running quick evaluations, even first level maintenance, they just board swap uh, and then run quick tests. Um, where we focus on is when you actually find that that doesn't solve a problem and there's some major issue in the network that's stopping a piece of equipment to work, then you need to have deep insight into what's happening at that point that allows you to debug it, understand what's happening and obviously get the thing back up and working again. And so we provide tools that provide deep insight to what's happening in networks. And that fits in nicely with the ethos that we provide in our tools in the R&D environment, which gives deep insight into performance and evaluation for evaluating uh, new equipment coming to market. So our customer sets fall into four major broad sets. Starting the top left, you've got the equipment vendors, the telecoms equipment vendors, names you'll have recognized Ericsson, Nokia, Huawei, Cisco, Sienna. They represent roughly about 55% of our business, and they are using our products in that R&D verification and conformance test state. So their engineers developing new equipment, that's when they use our test solutions. About 15% of our, our business comes from the network operators. 
So these are the companies, again, names you'll be familiar with, BT, AT&T, China Mobile. And again, they, they use our maintenance tester, but they actually use our R&D testers because especially the large operators, they actually always run evaluations of new equipment before they deploy it in their networks. And they use the exact same testers uh, or equipment because they're running a very similar set of tests that the designers are using in the vendors. So they use our R&D testers for that evaluation as well. The third set of customers in the, the telecom space is the bottom right, is the component manufacturers. Intel, Qualcomm, Broadcom, these companies that make very sophisticated chipsets that were high functionality. They make chips and they sell them to the vendors who build them into their products, who then sell them to the operators to build networks. Again, they need to do standards conformance tests and prove performance. So again, they're using our R&D type testers to do their testing. And they represent more like seven, eight percent of our business. And then the last set in the top right is a growing set, a, a customer set that's growing for us. They're currently around 22, 23% of our business. These are either the large enterprises that run their own networks like banks and Walmart and companies like that. And then also the hyperscale companies, the companies here, Facebooks, Googles, that are building these huge data uh, centers and running these. These are almost like mini networks and they have this, a lot of the similar challenges that the operators and the telecoms people have. So we are selling to these people as well and see, see them as a growth opportunity for us as we move forward. The telecoms is very much a space that's all about innovation. You know, we hear a lot about 5G cloud computing. And for me, 5G, people, it's presented to the consumer world like a spot technology. You had 3G, you had, you had 4G, here's some 5G. But it's much more than that. It's really about the evolution of the whole mobile network to support the smart cities of the future. There's an insatiable desire to get more information through the network from more applications, new applications, new things that are coming along, new things that we don't know about today that will influence everybody's life in the future. And while telecoms is really an enabler for that, and they have to create the platform, the mobile connectivity that allowed all these applications and companies to offer these new services to you. So really, to me, 5G is a euphemism of the evolution of the uh, mobile network to get to meet the needs of the smart cities. The same with cloud computing. There's a huge movement of moving data into the cloud. That means there's vast amounts of data moving back and forward. And companies and employees, rather than just using networks within businesses, now need networks that run across literally tens of kilometers to, to, to work correctly. So this is causing huge changes within the telecoms industry. It's the, the whole architectures need to change to be able to support all this new, this huge growth in data, new type of services. And in terms of doing that, it's all about bringing new, you know, the operators also need to make money. So they need to use technology that allows them to deliver these services at a cost effective price. And so the very much we see the movement in the architectures, the new architectures, new equipment, new topologies, new services, all need to be tested and checked. And therefore, that's what's driving the telecoms test industry. It's the fact there's so much change happening. And to me, it's an incessant change that's going forward and will go on for years to come until people decide they've got enough and they need no more. And that's unlikely to happen for a very, very long time. Oh, excuse me. So that's who Carnex are. That's wh where we fit in the world. So let's talk about FY21 and what happened last year. Well, in a year that was a very difficult year for many companies, we had an exceptional year. We actually had really strong trading across all our product lines. So we've got three main product lines and all three of them uh, exceeded our targets we set at the beginning of the year. We also split the world into three major regions and all regions exceeded targets that were set at the beginning of the year. So we really had a great year. It felt as if that the, the chaos that was happening in the world because of COVID really didn't affect our business at all. We fairly quickly moved into a remote working scenario, as did our customers. And fortunately for us, our customers very successfully moved to remote working. So they continued their projects, continued their investment in test equipment. So we really didn't see any blip. If anything, we've seen a positive upside in a bizarre sort of way. There was two things that we feel have actually had a positive short-term effect, and these are these are really driven by 
the effect of the pandemic. So they're not really changes in the industry. It's just the way certain companies have reacted and what's happened to change the, you know, to deal with the, the bizarre scenario we all faced last year. The first thing is that we believe in our top 10 customers, three of customers pulled our orders forward that we would have expected to get an FY22 into FY21, which seemed roughly between 0.8 and 1.1, 1.2 a business that we felt we closed this year that we would have expected to close next year. Now that may seem a bit strange to you. Why would you spend early? What we see in large companies is that, you know, when most of our in engineering teams, they use their capital spend to buy our products. And what happens, and we've seen this in the past happening, is when companies think there's trouble coming over the horizon that they may get cut. And as we all know, especially large corporations, the first lever they pull when they think there's financial difficulties coming is the capital spend budget. So what we see slightly bizarrely is the engineering teams spend quickly. So they spend the money before they get it, before the budgets get cut. And that's what we think we've seen here is that some people have placed orders three to six months earlier than we would have otherwise expected them to place orders. We have seen some customers slow their spend pattern slightly and already we're starting to see that pick up. So there has been kind of ripples caused by what's happened in the recent period, nothing that's changing the underlying dynamics, but it has brought the orders forward. The other big difference that affected us is we travel a lot. You know, we build strong relationships with our customers. It's a very technical sale that we do. So we normally travel a lot. And of course, nobody could travel last year. All travel stopped and we saved around £400,000 compared to what we spent the year before and what we budgeted for at the start of the year on travel. And obviously that just falls straight through. We expect travel to come back this year. China, our team in China already, they've been traveling since the back end of last year. Travel, travel opened up. We're starting to see in the US it opening up again. And in Europe, hopefully in the next few months, it'll open up again. So we expect to see the travel spend to go back up this year. But there was a definitely a, 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 much, a much reduced travel spend last year. And so the combination of that extra revenue, a million pound of revenue falling through to around 600K of, of profit plus the 400k that we didn't spend, we also seen the EBITDA and PBT increase by about a million. But even underneath that million that we say, we still had a great year. And of course, on top of having a great year and dealing with the pandemic, we floated the company as well. And we floated in and, and listed in October. And as part of that exercise, we raised capital for further investment in the business. And, and then, so by the end of the year, we were sitting with an additional nine million of cash generation. Actually, a couple of that in more detail later, but it's roughly half came from the, the float, plus the less came from the, the, the upside in the business that we generated from the, the positive of trading. As part of the float, um, and, and we said we were going to invest in our teams and grow the business, and we have been doing that through last year. And you can see that in the chart, how much we've grown as well as we plan to continue and complete that uh, growth phase through the first part of this year. We've invested in our business development teams, both out in the field that support customers, as well as the support teams back in the, in the main offices. And we've obviously grown our R&D teams to give us a bigger footprint and more bandwidth to go after the opportunities that are ahead of us. One of the other big initiatives we had internally was to look at our quality management system. We've seen through the many years and going through growth phases, that you have to be careful when suddenly you start to grow quickly that processes and things that have worked in the past suddenly start to creak and are less efficient than they were in the past. So very much we got an ethos of continuous improvement, looking at things, always looking for ways to improve them. And we had a major push in the last year to improve the way we go about that, make it more systematic in the way we do that, ensuring that we're always efficient and effective in, in the way we go about doing a business. One of the other things that Ashley will share with you is a lot of the metrics that we look at in our business in terms of the split of business between the three main regions, the amount of repeat business we get versus new customers, um, all the trains were pretty much on track to follow on the same trajectory that we've seen in the previous years. So in some ways last year for us was in, some, in a bizarre way like a business as usual, albeit it ended up being an exceptional business as usual. And that gives us confidence looking forward that it wasn't just because we had a good year because we had one big deal or one region was doing well, that everything seems to be moving as we would expect in a positive trajectory. So that feels good. 
We have two major relationships with other companies. We work with Spirant Communications, who provide a sales channel for around 70% of our, our deals. And we also have a contract manufacturer, Kelvin Side Electronics, who do all our, our manufacturing for us. These are relationships that have been in place for um, with Spirant, it's seven years. Kelvin Side, it's over 10 years we've been working with them. And these relationships stay strong. Where again, it was very much a business as usual. We work closely with both these companies again to keep continually to look for ways to be better at what we do together. But with the relationships remain strong, and we continue, to, we expect them to continue moving forward for the foreseeable. And finally, I think like everybody's found, you know, we were all forced to work from home. We didn't actually choose it. Let's be let's be honest. But we actually have learned a lot, and you know, and we've found that our team's been actually at times more effective working from home, their work-life balance is better, and they're actually being more business effective. So we're already looking forward into the, the post-lockdown phase of how we create a hybrid model and let our teams benefit from the best of both worlds, both the teams and the business. We'll have times when people are in the office, but we'll have times where people can work from home much more than they did in the past, because we know it's actually better for the team and it's better for the business. It's a win-win situation. If we have a quick look at our three main product families, we have three, a business falls into three sectors. We've got a lab sync, a cloud and IT, and field sync. All three of them did really well, and we strengthened our position in, all th in the market with all three of them over the last year. In the lab sync, the Paragon Neo remains the market, you know, the de facto standard for proven standards conformance for the transfer of synchronization through the network, a critical part of the architecture that's required to support the expansion of the mobile network. So we had some new releases last year. These went down well with customers, and we've seen good growth across all regions and across all our customer sets. There's also been within the industry, there's a new alliance formed, which is like a standards body. Sometimes they call them forums, sometimes they call them standards bodies. The ORAN Alliance, and this is all about getting more companies involved. It was started by a number of the large operators who are always keen that there's competition and everybody involved in providing products to them. Um, so they basically started this ORAN Alliance. There's now about 260 companies involved. We're involved in it. And it's basically about specifying equipment that can be used in the RAN. That's the random, the radio um, access network. So it's not just the radio towers you see at the side of the road, but it's the architectural, the stuff close by in the architectural ways to the radio tower, all the equipment. And it's basically defining, breaking the, the whole system down into a number of parts and defining the blocks, the building blocks that allow smaller companies to come in and start playing. Now, how that's going to change the dynamics of the, the industry, I would say it's too early to say. We probably need to give it a year or two to play out to see what it changes. But we are seeing a number of new companies starting to ask us about synchronization tests. And so that's good for us. The more people involved, then the bigger the, the market opportunity for us. In the cloud and IT with our network emulation products, we've got the two products. The Atero is very much aimed at the high performance applications. We've had good success over the last year with that, especially in with the, the data center guys. And the SNE is more about the people not in the high performance, but wanting, high com wanting to emulate complex networks with many different interfaces on many different rates, multi-user type applications. And our SNE has done really well there. We've had a large focus on uh, basically being a, from a marketing attack, being a lot more application focused, really showing the customer how they can use our product, which is really, you can think of it as a tool set with many capabilities, but really showing them how they can apply it and gain value in, in their application. But also that, that's important that, that the engineers understand it, but also their managers understand where the value comes because it's the managers that actually sign the purchase rights to buy their engineers the tools. So again, we've seen good growth last year uh, in terms of growing our market with that product. And then we've got our field sync product. So uh, the lab sync product is all about testing in the R&D application. The field syncs once you're out in the field and that maintenance application. Again, we're doing making good progress. More and more of the 4G, 3G and 4G networks are starting to use time as a way of synchronization. And that's where we're starting to see growth. There's actually, there is deployment of 5G networks, but there are not many of them moving into the, the, uh, the maintenance phase yet. So we see that as a future growth opportunity for Sentinel in that uh, as, as the 5G networks start to move forward. 
We're also seeing a second application appearing, which is interesting for us, where in the large data centers, they're actually distributing in these large, physically very large warehouses, they're distributing time to all the servers and they're using the Sentinel to prove they've got accurate time across the whole of their data center. So we've had some early success in there and it's an application we hope to exploit more in the, in the years ahead. So at that point, I'm gonna pass over to Ashley and she's gonna give you a bit more detail on the actual numbers. Ashley. Thanks, thanks Tommy. And so through these next few slides, I'll take you through our financial KPIs and our revenue model KPIs, where you can see some of the different elements of our revenue drivers. And before taking you on to the PL um, income statement detail and the cash flow detail as well. So just so you can see from the KPI snapshot here, and, and you'll already have seen this in the RNS and Tommy's already um, touched on it. Calix has had a very strong um, performance in the year. Um, revenues of just under 18 million in the year have grown 31% on FY20 which in itself grew at 31% on FY19. And as Tommy mentioned in the earlier slides, we saw order intake and revenue performance increase, increase across all three product lines in the year. And we believe there was an early pull through of about 0.8 million to 1.1 million of orders and revenue from FY22 into FY21. Um, so that's that's supplementing that, that 17.9 or 18 million revenue number. I'll, I'll cover, cover that in a second as well. Gross profit grew 31% as well. So that's very much driven by the volume of revenue for, from the top line. Our, our margin is sitting at 78% at the moment, which you'll see on the PL in a couple of slides time. That's very much in line with, with the averages from the previous um, couple of years. So um, the, the growth in gross profit from a pound perspective is very heavily driven by, by the growth in revenue. And we ended the year with a 28% 28, 28 adjusted uh, profit before tax number. So that's profit before tax adjusted for exceptional costs from the IPO, um, which again, I will show you more detail on when we get to the slide on the income statement. And as Tommy mentioned earlier, that's aided by the savings and travel events costs as a result of everybody working from home during COVID and also the profit effect um, of the early pull through of revenues in, in FY22. From FR22, sorry. Statutory EPS, you'll see from the RNS, it's sitting at 4.18 pence per share. But if that's adjusted for the IPO cost and the related tax um, deductions from the IPO, adjusted EPS uh, is 5.21 pence per share compared to 3.66 pence in FY20. And the strong trading performance supplemented by the 4.9 million funds, uh, 4.9 million pounds of funds raised at the IPO drove the cash balance to 12.7 million at the end of the year and a, a, an increase of, of 9 million, as Tommy mentioned, from 3.7 million at the end of FY20. And within that net cash number of 9 million, net, net cash flow of 9 million, we also spent 3.3 million on R&D, which is an increase of, of 0.4 million on the previous year as we start the next phase of ramp up in an investment on, on our in our R&D teams. But I'll, I'll cover that later in the cash flow as well. So just on to the revenue metrics. Um, the revenue model metrics just help you um, hopefully understand a little bit more about the drivers of our, of, of, our, uh, of our orders and our revenue. So just starting from the top left of this slide here, um, You'll see from if, if you saw any of the IPO data or the, the, the um, anything we talked about the half year, our global customer base and distributor um, network leads us to have three main geographical regions or segments, and that's Americas, North Asia, and rest of the world. And the average spread of orders across these regions usually sits at a, a third, a third, a third each across each of these regions. And as you can see from the graph, FY21 was no different. Um, We've got an even split of orders across all three divisions, which allows us just to maintain that spread of risk across these three regions. Now, that 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 differs to the revenue split that you'll see in the operating segments part of the, the notes to the RNS. And the only difference there is timing on when we ship the product. So, so the orders are sitting at a third, a third, a third. The revenues may be slightly different just due to the lumpiness of timing on, on revenues. Um, just moving round to the right-hand side of the, the top part of the, the charts here, 
we, uh, although we have a, a lot of our customers are telecoms customers, which Tommy covered, um, a growing proportion of our customer base is coming from the non-telecom sectors, which include the hyperscale and enterprise customers mentioned earlier. So in FY20, FY20 we had 22% of, of our orders coming from these non-telecoms customers, and that's grown slightly to 23% in FY21, which just shows a steady increasing trend in that area. Our top 10 customers have contributed to 49% on average over the last three years compared to a prior year, three year average of 48%. That number, that number if, if you're just looking at the, the, the years, it tends to, tends to stay around that, that number. We have a high level of repeat demand from these customers and that's demonstrated by the nine year average length of relationship we have with them. And then we, we not only have a high level of repeat demand on our top 10 customers, we've got that across the, the whole customer base. So that's what the graph on the bottom right hand side is showing here. The repeat revenue pie chart here shows that the last three year average repeat revenues generated to 31st of March 21 was 80 percent. Um, all while the customer base was continuing to grow from 177 in FY20 to 192 revenue generating customers in, um, in FY21. So just on to the full year results and the income statement. Just to cover the graph on, on, on the right hand side, just to give you a little bit more flavour on our on our revenue. Um, as you'll know, Cal Calnex generates revenues through, through the sale of bundled hardware and software, as well as software support and extended warranty programmes. And as you can see from the graph, on the right, the split of the revenue streams in FY21 was very much in line with previous years. Generally speaking, this is a 90% to 10% split, bundled hardware and software and software support. Um, and as you can see, that's that's um, in FY21, that's that's in line with, with that metric. So just on the income statement, we've talked about revenues already, so um, and, and we touched on gross margin. So I'll just I'll just start with start with gross margin and, and work down the main categories. So um, margin was seventy eight percent, as I mentioned earlier, in line with the previous year averages for the business. Now gross margins can fluctuate through the year um, and year on year, depending on the mix of products, the mix of the bundle of hardware and software, and then the mix of those two things together as well. So that mix variability can give a uh, percentage movement here or there, but um, in in general, um, we see that 78% being very much in line with previous performance. Ad administrative costs, excluding depreciation and amortization are shown in the table here, but adjusting for the exceptional costs, which are shown, shown below, so adding them back, the administrative costs were 6.5 million in FY21 compared to 4.8 million in FY20. And that increase in admin costs in the year is driven by a few things. So increased staff costs as we built the teams across the business, as Tommy covered earlier, increased or higher sales team commissions. Just as a result of our increased trading performance, the, as the orders go up, that, that cost is variable um, linked, to, linked to the orders. Um, higher professional fees post IPO. So you know we floated right in the middle of our year. So H2 has a lot more um, professional fees in there and share incentive scheme costs as a, as a result of being listed on AIM. We now have a HMRC um, approved SIP scheme in place for staff where we match um, one for one um, share purchases through that. And that cost all goes into admin costs. Um, we had some um, increase for foreign exchange translation costs hit the P&L just as the US dollar weakened against sterling in the later part of the, the year. And that was all offset by those travel savings, the travel and events cost savings that we mentioned earlier as a, as a result of everybody being at home. Amortisation of R&D costs increased by 0.3 million in the, in the year compared to last year as a result of increases in R&D investment in this year and in recent years before that. So we, we capitalise our R&D and amortise that over five years. So any spend in, the, in, the, in any any ramp ups in spend in that previous five years can can impact the amortisation slightly there as well. One off exceptional costs you'll see are listed here, all linked to the IPO. Um, IPO fees of one point one million. Um, we, we also, in addition to that, we issued some free shares through the SIP scheme I mentioned. 
Um, to all staff on IPO, that costs us 166k, so we've classed that as an exceptional one-off item. And share-based payments of 0.2 million, they're all share-based payments relating to the share options in issue pre-IPO. That um, the, the, the options are a vesting condition that, uh, that was an exit event, i.e. the IPO. So all, all share options were, were exercised at that point. All share-based payments costs going forward will just sit in, in administrative costs as normal. Um, all that led us to the adjusted profit before tax figure um, of 5.1 million. So that, so that adjusted PBT just strips out the exceptional costs. Um, and that's compared to the 3.5 million in FY20. And that 3.5 million is adjusted for any, any um, IPO related costs. And that's just that share based payment piece and the, the discontinued operations that we had in, in FY20. And just as we've covered already, but just to just to, um, just to cover it again um, uh, briefly, the COVID impact um, was twofold on that profit line. The impact of the pull through of revenues, the 0.8 to 1.1 million, if you take a mid-range on that or you, you, you just use million as a round number, that that um, dropped through to profit at, at around 0.6 million of, a, of a, a, a benefit to the profit in FY21. And then added to that, we've got the 0.4 million on travel and events costs in the year as a result of the pandemic restrictions. So, um, so that, that brings you to the, to the million impact that we mentioned in the RNAs. Just last, one last thing on this, on this slide here, tax charge you'll notice is a lot lower than last year. So 194K in the year compared to 694K in FY20. And that's driven by, by two main things that we, as a result of the IPO mentioned earlier, there were share options that exercised for, for, um, for um, Calnix employees. All UK based employee share option exercises are eligible for tax relief. Um, so we, we took that tax relief benefit in the year that had an impact of, or that had the uh, a beneficial impact to the tax rate of reducing it by 15%, reducing from the 19 usual percentage, um, reducing that by 15% on the effective tax rate. There was also a review of our R&D tax credit um, claiming process. We are, um, we are heavily, um, in the past, we've been heavily um, covered by from an R&D tax credit perspective, um, directed into the large company scheme because we've, we've had a lot of grant funding in the past. This year, we, are, we were able to take a, a split across the two R&D um, tax claiming processes. We were able to take advantage of the RDEC scheme, the large company scheme, plus the small, um, the SME scheme, because some of our projects aren't covered by, by the, the one grant that we've got in place um, at this moment in time. So 0.5 million of our R&D spend was eligible to sit under that SME scheme. And that just gave us uh, an additional 130% um, um, accelerated, accelerated deduction on our, on our tax um, taxable profits, which led to uh, just over 3% reduction in our tax effective uh, rate for that. All other reconciling items there are all due to the fact that some of our IPO costs were disallowable, so that brings the rate back up. We'd expect going forward our rate to, to, to remain in the, in the 21-22% um, effective tax rate level. Onto the cash flow, and as you can see, the, the cash ge generated in the year very, very heavily driven by the trading performance and by uh, the funds raised the IPO. So just working down the main categories and the cash flow, net cash generated from operations was 9.1 million in the period. And that's um, driven by working capital movements. So the working capital movements represented a, ca a cash inflow of 1.9 1, 1, um, million in the year. And that's driven by a few things. So we've got stock increases in line with growth in, in, in shipments. We've got lower year-end debtor balances just as a result of, of our customers paying on time this year. Um, so every, everybody had paid, uh, paid pretty much on time. Um, increases in deferred warranty ba balances. So the deferred warranty balances are driven by the orders that we get in for our warranty and support, um, uh, warranty and support service and product that we 
we recognise that revenue over the life of the product as opposed to just recognising it on sale. So anything that's over a year um, of our, of our anything that serves the customer for over a year has to sit on the balance sheet and gets and gets amortised to the PL as revenue as you go through. We also had some accrued grant income, which I'll cover in just a second, that we had to hold on the balance sheet. That gets recognised over um, over uh, five years in line with our R and D recognition policy. And we had an increase in that grant income in the year. And we had some year-end sales bonuses being accrued that were paid out in April, plus a profit share bonuses paid to staff uh, that, that we paid out um, as a result of the exceptional year that we had. Cash in, used in investing activities is predominantly cash spent on R&D, as you can see. So um, cash spent on R&D in the period was 3.3, as I mentioned before, and that's 18% of revenues. That compares to 21% of revenues in FY20. However, our usual metric for R&D cash spend to revenues in a period of ramp up, which is what we're in right now, um, should be around about 25% of revenues. So we should expect to see that metric going forward into FY22 and FY23 as we continue the, the phase of ramp up on our R&D activities. Cash earned earned on financing activities in the year was 3.3 million, and that compares to a cash spend of 0.8 million last year. And that, that's, as you can see, is predominantly driven by the IPO funds raised. So the new shares issued on listing raised 6 million before expenses, and, and including expenses that takes you to the 4.9 million of, of IPO funds, net IPO funds raised. We also um, raised 0.3 million as a result of the share options exercise on IPO and we also we used the funds from the IPO part part of the funds from the IPO to pay down a term loan that we had outstanding uh, um, at, at the end of September so that was 1.9 million was paid off um, on, on the term loan to take us to, to, to zero term loan liability and that was replaced by a, a 3 million revolving credit facility which was put in place after IPO was currently sitting undrawn. Um, as I mentioned before, we had some increased grant um, cash in the in the year. Scottish Enterprise paid us some, some grant monies in advance, which you can see is that 0.6 million sitting in the cash flow there. Again, we can't recognise that to the PL um, all at once. We have to recognise that over five years. So that's just that's just that leading that um, driver of that working capital increase there. And that led us to a closing cash balance of 12.7 million, um, which leaves us in a really strong balance sheet position um, to take us into FY22. And I'll just hand you back to Tommy to cover the rest of the slides. Okay, thank you, Ashley. Sorry, trouble with the mute button now. Um, so a just quick look at the strategy. You know, we still believe the strategy we presented last year when we floated is still the right one, and all the drivers we're seeing is, is reinforcing it's the right one. Basically, we are focused, the two big growth drivers within the telecom sector is, is the, the evolution of the mobile network, or the 5G as it's referred to, um, and also the move to cloud computing. And we continue to, our product lines today are already aligned to these growth uh, trajectories, and we continue to to drive them forward and in the year ahead we've got some interesting releases coming out that we feel uh, will both uh, strengthen our position and protect our position in the market space and the lab sync we will have um, and support the new high speed interfaces at 400 gigabits today we support 100 gigabits we'll support 400 gigs that's due to come out around September time and then within the field product we've got the new capability for the 5G we have got some limited capability for 5G today but the new, what we call it, over the air module, where it listens to the air signal to extract the synchronization, it'll be able to operate with 3G, 4G, and now 5G. So that product will be well positioned for us if these 5G networks uh, get deployed and move into the maintenance phase. In the cloud and computing area, then again, we've, we've, with our SNE product, we've got a good strong position there. We've got a new release coming out. It's kind of a major revamp of the software, which will allow it to be used with a, a web browser. It's a lot of usability improvements, but also what it's meant is the same software platform we can actually 
reuse it and create a virtual version of the product. So in, in that market space or in the network emulation, we've got an Otero product line, which is the high-end, high-performance product line. We've got the SNE for high complexity, um, flexibility, and now we're going to have a virtual version of the SNE, which will be for people that are developing applications and equipment to run in a kind of cloud environment. And so that really positions us for when our customers move towards the cloud environment, we've got the product they need as and when they do move. And really within these two major trends, we're always looking for new opportunities. And that's where the third element comes in, is the m &A. We need to keep finding new uh, growth opportunities that either gives us new products to go to the same customers, but, take, but is able to take more uh, different money off the table or find completely new customers. So within these trends, we are continually in discussion with customers looking for opportunity to get new products. And we plan to either do them by ourselves, or if we see other companies where we can benefit from doing a, a partnership, an M&A type application, uh, uh, maneuver, then we will do that as well. And that's still very much on the radar and part of our strategy moving forward. So to summarize and close off uh, this first part, F121 was just an exceptional year for us. Kind of everything worked well. Um, some, that doesn't often work, happen too often in life, but it did. All the product lines exceeded the initial targets, all the re Regions exceeded the initial targets. We had that extra benefit almost from COVID that actually made a, a really good year into an exceptional year. And we feel as we go into FY22, especially if you take that exceptional part that we feel of that million and, and kind of reset it, then we are still following the same trajectories. We feel the underlying trajectory in our markets can, can sustain over a, long, a, a three to four year period, a kind of 15% CAGR. And we believe that's the trajectory we are still on. And we feel really good going into this next period. The fact that all the dynamics of the market didn't change or they changed in a positive sense for us through this year, that we can go into this next year with confidence and hopefully deliver another great year of performance. So at that point, I think we're going to move to some Q&A. Fantastic. Tommy, Ashley, thank you very much indeed for your presentation. Ladies and gentlemen, do please continue to submit your questions using the Q&A tab situated on the right-hand corner of your screen. But just while the company take a few moments to review those investor questions submitted already, I'd like to remind you the recording of the presentation, along with a copy of the slides and the published Q&A, can be accessed via your investor dashboard on the Investor Meet Company platform. I'd also like to remind you that your feedback is important to the company, and immediately after the presentation is ended, you will be redirected for the opportunity to provide your feedback in order the team can better understand your views and expectations. Um, Tommy, Ashley, you've had an awful lot of questions come through um, and we may not be able to get through all of these. So um, thank you very much to the investors who submitted them. Obviously, the company will be able to review all questions submitted today. But perhaps if I could just hand back to you and um, where appropriate to do so, if you could read out those questions, um, that would be fantastic. Thank you. Sure. Um, so there's a couple here that I can answer um, uh, straight away. So, um, We've got a question here from Adrian C. Why did revenues from North Asia fall? Just just to give you a bit more flavour around the revenue and order sort of relationship, uh, the the revenues from North Asia fell um, compared to last year. But actually, from an orders perspective, and so so timing wise, um, from an orders perspective, they actually grew by three percent. Um, so it is very much when you're looking at that segmental analysis in the in the back of the the, the notes to the accounts, it's just just worth keeping in mind that, that the revenues are very very heavily driven by timing at the same time. So um, so, so that North Asia um, growth is, is still there. Um, next question is from Adrian, Adrian C as well. Um, is the company still considering a dividend in FY22, as mentioned in the IPO admission document? And the answer to that is yes, we are um, we are um, due to implement a progressive dividend policy starting in FY22. There's a couple of questions here I can pick up, I think, Ashley. Um, it's from Damien. The first one was, when do you expect uh, to go back to the previous cost levels for travel and meetings? Um, we are kind of assuming in the second half of this year, Damien, you know, it obviously stopped last year, China's back to normal. Um, we've kind of planned in a, in a financial plan for this year that by the second half it's back to normal and through this first half it's kind of ramping up. And at the, the moment, our best guess is we're actually seeing a, a team in the US are starting to travel. I think by July, August they'll be back to normal. 
I think the European team and in the other regions, perhaps at the same time, you know, you can all see what's happening in the papers, you know, when it's going to happen. Because ultimately, it's when are we comfortable at travelling, the government let us, but then it's also partly driven by when um, the, uh, the customers want us to meet them again. So that's that's a bit uncertain. But we're kind of assuming by the second half, we back to that. And I think the second part to that question is really, you know, will it go back to the same as before? Well, we expect initially it will, because obviously we want to keep meeting people. Uh, we want to keep using video technology. But we want to keep meeting people because um, there is value in having face to face. So the fact we haven't seen a lot of these people now for 18 months, we we'll want to go out. And I think it will probably be more towards the middle of FY23 that we'll see whether that levels down, whether there is a, an underlying reduction, because people are now a lot more willing to take video meetings rather than always wanting us to turn up in person. So um, that's where we are on that one. You had another question, Damien, about with the new R&D hires, can you say anything about the, how the new capacity will be deployed? Are customers asking you to develop new products? When, uh, where would you previously lack R&D capacity? And is there plans to uh, plan more about improving existing products? Um, yeah, yes. Uh, kind of everything. <laughs> so we basically, we, we have started hiring people. We kind of see, you know, if you look at it from the point somebody comes in the door to when they actually generate revenue, it can be up to about 18 months. You know, some a new engineer coming in, it takes them, let's say, three to four months to settle in, start getting involved in the team. Our projects typically take nine to 12 months to run. Some of them are slightly shorter. Some of them, the big ones are slightly longer. So you can see it can take about 18 months before that investment in R&D comes through. So we're in the sort of business where you, where you have to believe that you, you, know, you, you see opportunity and going for it. We do actually get, especially as part of having this relationship with customers and why it's important for us to keep speaking to people, we do have customers that come and ask us for products. They ask us all the time about enhancements to our platforms. And that actually is a key part of how we decide what to do by taking that input from customers, looking at it, make sure we understand why they're asking it. Because sometimes they can do what they're asking. There already is capability in the product. They just didn't realize it. Our products have got many, many tools in them. And sometimes the customers don't realize everything they've got. But really, that customer feedback is critical to us to actually continue to make sure we are tracking what their needs are and know what they're going to need in the future. And there are occasions where they come and ask us to do whole products and that's part of the potential opportunity for new product lines in the future. We always engage with customers on these and look at them but ultimately we don't do bespoke solutions. We are looking for opportunities where people come and ask us for something but we can then see that this actually has got a general purpose need and that we can actually create a whole market for it rather than deliver a, a bespoke solution to one person. And the teams that we've basically as you can see we've actually got new capability, we've got access of programs and all the product lines so these people are being deployed into all the product lines to strengthen the team and all three of them thank you ashley you got any other question you've come up with you can answer um yeah so um just what one more from damien actually you said in the sources of revenue section you use a three-year average can you explain why you, you're using an average rather than the just the split for the year and also in the section you provide a geographic split of orders but the table refers to a revenue percentage is that labeling error or I am am I missing something important and um, so on the three-year average it's just really it just for, from our perspective it just really lends lends a bit of flavor for for we believe for the for the reader to kind of see how particularly for the geographic piece how that doesn't really move over over the, th the three year period, but actually, if you're looking at the the annual the annual periods, it, it, it doesn't shift too much either. So we we just chose that three year average um, because it also smooths out a little bit of kind of um, year on year slight slight lumpiness. But um, we we just believe it gives it a little bit more flavour. And you're exactly right. Thank you for pointing that out. The table refers to a revenue percentage, but it should refer to an order percentage. So uh, apologies for that. And thank you for pointing that out. There's always somebody going to catch you, Ashley, with the wrong slide. <laughs> Simon's asked a question here. A fantastic performance. Can you continue double digit growth? Uh, what constraints do you face? I think continuing the growth we've had in the last couple of years is going to be difficult. You know, I think underlying, we believe 
that the underlying growth trends that were that are driving our business um, are more double double digits, but more like double uh, teens, low teens to mid teens. And so when we look through, we still think we are on that trajectory. Over, uh, if you look over, look at the CGR over on uh, three, four years, that we're on that fifteen percent. You know, I think one of the challenges for us to keep outstripping that, and obviously there's two challenges. We need to keep on that with the active programs, but then every so often we need to find something new, whether it's by ourselves, as we talk about organic growth or inorganic, that's actually going to add a bit extra on top of that. So we feel good about what we can do with the current product lines. We are always challenging ourselves to find new things, and it will always be a challenge for a company like us to always try and find something else to do. Got a question here from um, John. Um, hi, Tommy and Ashley. Thanks for doing this presentation. Heard of you, but haven't looked into you until now. A few questions. Can you tell us how much money you're spending on R&D as a percentage of sales? And what what is the direction of travel? And also, can you talk to us about your R&D innovation strategy? Um, so hopefully answered that first part of the question around the percentage of cash spent to revenues. Um, 19% in this year, um, uh, moving up towards that 24, 25% in the in future if, if FY22 and FY23 as we ramp up those those teams and, and add, add add to the skill base. Tommy, did you want to cover the R and D innovation strategy? I think that's that that has been asked a few times on in, in the questions, so it might cover off some of the. So do you want to, could you read that one again, please, Ashley? Yeah. John's just asked, can you talk to us about your R&D innovation strategy? Yeah, well, I guess um, from the point of view that, you know, in some ways it's all driven by what customers need. Uh, we continually are looking to, to meet what the customer needs. We're, we're running the, the, the sharp edge. And in some ways, like for example, uh, we talk about coming out with 400 gigabits capability this year. And, and you may know that other test vendors out there have 400 gigs and they've had it for a year or two. But fundamentally, for the type of test that we do in synchronization, the technology wasn't available until last year for us actually to deliver a solution for the type of high precision to, uh, measurement that we do. So we are continually looking at that, continually finding ways to improve performance and, uh, from an innovative point of view. Um, we also actually run innovative um, sessions in the, in the organization as well from the point of view of getting different people to come in and get, get involved. Um, so it is a kind of key part to what we're doing. So for me, innovation is not just about coming up with a, a magic widget. It's, it's about doing what we do better. And, you know, we've done a lot with our plat products to create platform products. And a, and a lot of the change that we've done in the SNE that I mentioned from a customer perspective, they won't see it, but we've restructured the software to make it far more extendable because our products, products have to continually be extended. And if you're not a true platform, then it's quite hard to add things on. And it's all about creating that right architecture internally that you can add things on and there's not a premium cost because you've added it into it to the architecture. So it is something we do all the time. We're continually changing the way we do things. We're continually trying to make ourselves better. Uh, what we do and make ourselves quicker at getting product to market. There's a question here from John that's uh, it's a bit tricky, but um, an old political front, but we'll have a go. Uh, sorry to ask, but have you got any contingency plans if Scotland in the future decides to vote for independence? Uh, how is your supply chain? How interlinked are you with the other parts of the UK? Independence, there you go. How long have you got? So. <laughs> Actually, I'm not particular. You know, I think you know if you looked at Brexit, we weren't because we already got a global footprint. We're not completely, you know, we don't are tied into one local market. Um, you know, when Brexit happened, we really didn't have any effect from it. All I said, you know, we sell through partners in Europe who already imported products from other test vendors in other parts of the world, so they're able to do it. And because our products typically have a four to six week lead time. The fact that it may have taken a bit longer in ports to get it across the border, it really didn't matter to us. And I kind of see Scotland that way in, in terms of things. I mean, it's hard to predict exactly what it's going to be, but we've got that global footprint. We already sell internationally. We sell into country, you know, we sell into Europe. We sell into countries we've got relationships with. We sell in the UK's got relationships with. We've sell into countries we don't have strong relationships with as a country. So. 
you know, I'm sure there'll be uh, there'll be a lot of heartache along the way. But in terms from a business point of view, I'm you know, I think there'll be bumps that'll create problems for us, but nothing that I don't think we'll be able to cope with at the time. You asked about the supply chain. Um, I kind of wonder whether you're really asking there about the, the a lot of discussion at the moment about shortages as components. Uh, I, I maybe should cover that because that is worth talking about. You know, last year when the pandemic came, there was a lot of talk of shortages of components. And it seemed we weren't affected by that at all um, because it seemed to be more about the, the high uh, the high volume people, the, the people at work are just in time manufacturing model where the components arrive at the front door in the morning and they're out the back door as a, comp as a, a product at the end of the day. You know, a, a lot of our components, because they're very sophisticated, we, we our products are low volume, high complexity. Our components, some of them are already, always run in kind of 12 to 15 week lead time. So we tend to sit with quite large levels of inventory in Kelvin side. They basically buy to our six month forecast. And of course, now there's a lot of talk of shortages in the world. And we've stepped up these forecasts to, and asked Kelvin side to go and buy to 12 months. Now, I do suspect there's a bit of a, the toilet roll effect happening here. You know, probably everybody else has done the same as what we've done. We've all just upped our order numbers, which is probably making a, a difficult situation worse. Um, so at this point in time, we don't see uh, any immediate problems, but we're very well aware of what's happening uh, in terms of suppliers are saying they're seeing uh, lead times for components going up. We're taking what steps we can at the moment, and we're going to stay very aware of it over the rest of the year. For me, I think it's probably going to last about a year, this or six months, six, nine months. There's a lot of new ca capacity in terms of foundries coming on board next year. There's new foundries being built in China and in North America. And I think the ones that are there are probably stepping up at the moment. But so through the next period, we don't see any issues at the moment, um, but we're keeping very close, uh, closely aware with it and working closely with Kelvin side to make sure we can keep the supplier components to meet our, our, our customers' needs. Um, there's a question here from Adrian um, that says, are the company predicting um, similar revenues in FY22 to FY21? And how is the order book in FY22 looking compared to FY21? So in terms of the, the guidance that our broker has, has given to the, the market, are, we, we expect our, our revenues remembering that, that we believe 1. Uh, uh, 0.8 to 1.1 million of revenues has been brought forward um, from, uh, from FY22 into FY21. If you take that into account um, and reduce our, our revenues in FY21, if you kind of add back that effect, it takes you down to, to around 17 million of revenues in this year. Um, and then, then we believe that that revenue should, would would increase in FY twenty two to an underlying revenue of, of of just over eighteen million. So, so on the face of it, um, if you're if you're looking at our reported revenues versus versus what what the market guidance is saying, it's it looks flat. Um, however, when when you look at the sort of drivers and and the COVID effect in there, there, there is there is growth in there. Um, in terms of um, the, the order book for, for this year, so, so, so the order book is looking very much in line with, with, with what we, we believe our, our forecasts or what, what the market guidance is saying just now. So, so me, Esther, I was just going to say, we're just coming up to that hour mark. Um, and I know you have had a lot of questions, which is great. Thank you for answering so many of them. Um, perhaps as we do come up to the hour, and thank you for, for the attendees for submitting them, the company will obviously have the ability to review all those questions submitted today and we will publish responses where it's appropriate to do so. Um, but just on that basis, Tommy, perhaps I could just ask you just for a few final words just to, to close up, please, before we redirect investors to give you some feedback. Okay, thank you for that. Uh, well, thanks very much for attending. Uh, I hope that's been of value to you. I hope you, uh, we managed to answer most of your questions. I will get right to them, but in terms of giving you an understanding of where we are and where we're going, you know, it has been a great year for us. We're really pleased with how the years went. Um, you know, I think we can, as, as I already mentioned, it's been a very satisfying year, not just because of the headline numbers, but because of the way that all our product lines have made progress. We've made progress in all regions. It's not been down to, hey, we've closed one big deal on one product line, uh, which is 
can be fine, but I think that kind of sustainability comes from moving everything forward and everything moved forward really well last year. As Ashley shared, a lot of our metrics underneath show that our business trajectories are staying on board. They're all going the same direction that we're going in previous years, which is all in the positive direction. So we feel really confident going into the year. You know, we've set forward a plan that we feel is robust and we feel good that we can we can deliver another strong year of performance. So thanks very much for your time and hopefully we'll see you again in the future. Fantastic. Tommy, Ashley, thank you indeed for updating investors today. Could I please ask investors not to close the session as you'll be automatically redirected for the opportunity to provide your feedback in order that the team can better understand your views and expectations. This would only take a few moments to complete and is greatly valued by the company. So do please give it your consideration. On behalf of the management team of Calix Solutions PLC, we'd like to thank you very much for attending today's presentation. That concludes today's session. Thank you and good afternoon.